Yeah. I think that's the difference. The agents that are super educated and can give their clients all the details, those are, those are the agents that have the ability to scale because those kind of risky decisions where you're not communicating openly and you're not facing the facts, that's what causes the clients to mistrust our industry. <laughs> Because the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's it's all click of a button, guys. So do you, I hear some are. birds. You got, any, you got any birds back there? We are live. Okay. So I was just telling Saul, I hope it's not distracting everybody who's watching today. I had to choose between children and birds. So you're going to hear some tweeting in the background. <laughs> um, so Saul and I were just talking backstage and we were talking about how it's so important to demonstrate your expertise, to give your clients confidence that they can count on you, that they can trust your ability to get the deal done and to support them. So Saul, do you wanna just talk a little bit about your perspective on how they get expertise and how they become a trusted resource um, yes, for clients? Yes, sure. So the first thing I kind of talk about is, is that you, in building confidence, there are a number of real easy things that you can do. Something as simple as making a promise and keeping it. Yes. Or just the easy things. Say, I make a promise. It could be like, I'll call you later. I'll send you an email. And, and then just, I could call them and say, I don't have any time, but, but just the act of making the promise and keeping it builds confidence. And a lot of times people don't think about that. I love that. I teach my agents to say, like, let's imagine in the exact scenario, you call them, they don't answer. Then you follow up with an email and you say, as promised, I gave you a call today at this time because they associate when Saul tells me something, he always keeps his word. When Carrie gives me a promise, I can count on her. And you're trying to build that credibility. So when the time is right and you're trying to structure the offer for them, they trust that the information you're giving them is credible. Absolutely. So it's the little things that make a difference. And while yes. it sounds like it's just a little thing, the fact is creating that pattern over time is incredibly valuable to the business that you're in. If the business you're in is selling something to someone. Yes. Uh, so being yeah, able to do that. And uh, okay. along that same line, building trust and confidence, uh, demonstrating expertise. And so it's always valuable to demonstrate expertise. Now, one way that I used to do it, and very few agents did it, is I would give the buyer a copy of the contract that we used ahead of time. And I would say, now, I want you to go through this. And I want you to, anything you have a question, I want you to be able to ask me that question and I'll answer. And agents wouldn't do that. And they're inevitably, at least when I did this, there were places, there were things in the contract that people could, that agents couldn't answer. And so they were afraid to and they were afraid to talk about liquidated damages, right? They were afraid to talk about certain things that were in the contract. And so they would avoid it. And yeah. I always thought the contract's my greatest tool. And so off one of my greatest tools. Often in California, we went when I started, we started with a one-page contract this size, right? And it went to then it went to two pages this size, then it went to two legal pages, then it went to four pages. And, and everybody would complain. They'd say, Oh no, more contracts. We gotta. You know, and then some people, they wouldn't even throw away their old contracts. They'd use them until they were <laughs> done, right? And I always said, no, I love it. If there's a new contract, there's new information. It gives me an opportunity to demonstrate expertise. Demonstrating expertise builds trust and confidence. That's what I want to do at every opportunity. Because if I don't have people's trust and confidence, they're not going to sign a contract with me. And, um, well, and worse, they they might they might commit to working with you but then when it comes down to them making the decisions that are required to actually win the home especially in a market like we're facing today they don't feel that confidence to listen to your advice and so they end up falling short of getting the desired outcome they want which is the house that they want yep, yeah absolutely so i started something the other day on lab code agents and that is to post a word a day 
Now, I get the definitions from my business partner for the last 30 years, John Riley, who wrote the book, The Language of Real Estate. It's now in its seventh edition. It is the Bible on real estate definitions. And so John's given me permission to use that. So every day or every other day, it depends, I'll post a word. And what I'm hoping is we start getting conversation around the words because we want people to engage. It's not just the definition. And the reason I think that's important is I guarantee there are going to be words that people don't know or don't remember, and it'll help them build that expertise. And if they're in a conversation, they can demonstrate. Now, I taught real estate principles and practices for 25 years, and people used to say to me all the time, and I know we differ a little bit on this. They'd say, I don't want to learn this. I'm never going to, I'm never going to, learn, I'm never going to use the fact that there are 43,560 square feet in an acre. Well, you know what? If you stay in real estate long enough, you will use a lot of this. And so, and then you'll even start to look for the opportunity to use it all for the purpose of building trust and confidence to be able to be really conversant in your chosen field, which is real estate. Yeah, so Saul and I were talking and I said, Saul, I tell all the people that come through my training, just cram, just focus, just get through the exam. And the reason I say that is because I feel like the, the standard getting your license falls so short. It's not that there's no value, but it falls so short of helping real estate agents feel prepared for the business. And there's tons of people that get their license. I believe the failure rate is just around 90% in the first year. 95% of people that get their license don't make it a full five years in the business. Yeah, I... so When you think about that, having some tactical ideas on how to show clients that you're competent. One of my favorite things is using data in the MLS to actually show the client sold comparables up front. So I've talked to you guys about this a lot. It's a process everyone on my team is trained to do. And it takes practicing out loud to get good at it. But ultimately, if you start the conversation by, you, uh, I think we all started the same way. You're trying to learn everything that's important to the client, why it's important to the client. Well, when you go from being a good listener to a problem solver, in my opinion, is when you start using the data of what's sold recently to have them show you what they would have bought. And that's a way to show them that you know the market to also showcase the statistics, what percentage over or under ask are properties going that are their desired properties. And it's also something that I think is a big mistake real estate agents make that make them not feel like experts. When we're trained as real estate agents to pull comps for a buyer, we're not trained the same way as we're trained when we pull comps for a seller. So let me say more about that. If you pull comps for the seller, you look for like properties. But when you pull comps for the buyer, you show them what's sold in the area. It's like an apple in the orange, because yeah. if your seller wants a turnkey property where everything's new and they get to walk in and live there and they're thrilled with that idea, right? And some of the things that have sold, even in the same building, are not in that condition. And you're looking at those comps to look at the percentage over or under asked. You're making a big mistake. That's the way the majority of agents do it. And so then what happens? Their clients underbid on their perfect property and they lose. And then agents, 30% of agents get fired the first time they lose a property. Because most of us are not asking I'm going to say most of you, I'm going to say it. Most of you are not asking for the signed buyer agreement. And right. so if they lose confidence in you because you haven't done a good job of selling the value of working with you and helping to put the ball in their court and showing them the data, you're in big trouble. And I have one more thing to add, and then I'll pass the ball over to you, Saul, to talk more about it. Um, the other thing that I see happening is Saul mentioned the contract. Well, I think the contract is really important and the way that we do it, we do give clients the first time we go out. I feel like um, some of my agents choose to do it in the initial meeting. They send them home with a copy of the contract so they can review it. For me personally, the way that I did it, I wanted to give them a little bit of important information every time we got together to build their level of confidence in me and not to overwhelm them. So I felt like focusing on the data in the initial meeting and getting the buyer agreement signed and learning what they want was all I could really handle in that conversation. 
So the way that I structured my process, I would always on the way to the first property. And yes, I used to drive with my clients to the property because I wanted to control their environment. And I wanted to be in a, in a situation where either one-on-one -on -one or the two of them and myself were together and had enough time to talk. And I believe that it's very important to educate the client on the decisions they need to make when they're crafting their offer. I think it's important to do that before you're in a situation where they're in the home they're in love with. Because when, as soon as you transition through that threshold, the door, where they're in love with the house, you become a salesperson instead of an educator. Because the, the way the dynamic works, when you educate them up front, there's no pressure. You're simply explaining the market and explaining the decisions they're having to make. When they have a house, they start to feel this pressure and anxiety. The more you can do to eliminate the pressure and anxiety once they're in that situation, the better. So we call it our 12 decisions and we walk them through. It's a, it's a little sheet of paper and we walk through. Here's each decision. Now the contract is gonna show you where we write that into the contract and you can review that. But before you review the contract, let's just talk about what the decisions mean. And that conversation helps us because the next house we go in might be the house, but then they've heard it all up front and they've made the decision on a lot of those choices. Yeah, absolutely, Carrie. So the, the idea there, so an, an informed client is a better client. And rather than have them have to learn something when the pressure's on, when they're getting ready, to, you want them to learn it when the pressure's not on. And so we always gave them the information. We taught them, we went out of our way. And we also knew that in the contract, there were many things that other agents couldn't talk about because they didn't know it. And we were able to do that. And that was a great differentiator. I'm going to go back to the, the exam. See, the the studying for the real estate exam. You're absolutely right. I think we actually agree. The real estate exam is not designed to prepare you to sell real estate. That's not its purpose. And so for people that have this expectation that I learned it, why do I have to learn it in real estate license school? I don't use it. The fact is that the course, the, the exam wasn't designed to teach you how to sell real estate. That's an important thing people don't realize. And right. so- they have to learn how to sell real estate somewhere else. You're not going to learn it to pass the exam. But when I look at people who sell real estate, and you're right, the attrition is atrocious in real estate for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is people say, I always said to people, it's not the real estate sales business. It's the real estate business. You can be in real estate sales your whole life, and there's nothing wrong with that. And you can sell houses and you can make a lot of money, but that ain't all there is to selling real estate. There's lots of different things. And maybe you're not good at selling houses. Does that mean you should get out of the real estate business? No. Maybe you'd be great at selling shopping centers. Maybe you'd be great at selling multiple units. There's many different avenues. Maybe you'd be great as a title rep. I mean, I don't know. There, but real estate is a huge field. So learning that body of knowledge and then figuring out what's important in whatever part and field you go into I think is critical. And I want to ask you, do you still take people out in your car? I used to love the time that I could build rapport in the car. Oh, I loved it. I, I A secret about me, most people think, oh, Carrie has a big team. So she, she likes listings. I love working with buyers. I love working with buyers because I like the emotional support that comes with solving their problems and having them feel so happy. And a lot of sellers, they no matter how well you do selling the home, many of them are going to still have the mindset that they wish they could have got more money, right? Because they all have this, many of them, I shouldn't say all, they all have this perspective though, like, oh, I, I think that my house has this, this, and this, it's better, so I should have got that, right? It's not as gratifying for me. So the do you still do it or do you not take them out anymore? I haven't worked with buyers for years, like eight yeah. years. Yeah. So I do a lot of coaching around how to work with buyers and I'm right in the trenches with my agents. I train my agents on all of the conversations and the process and everything that I'm so obsessed with because I believe that if you have a plan, a structured plan, some agents don't need that because they're amazing at what they do and they're able to be unicorns, right? But the problem is when they try and duplicate themselves, when they get so successful that they're starting to want to rip their hair out because they have too much business and they feel themselves starting to drop balls or starting to not be there for their friends and family, 
they have to have a process to plug someone else into what they're doing. And if they're winging it all the time, it's very difficult to have someone step in and be successful at winging it. Yeah. We used to say uh, when we brought technology to the real estate industry in 1995, we had this thing that we would say to realtors, we would say, the days of the real estate mortician are gone forever. You know, the real estate mortician where you throw people in the backseat of your car and you drive them around till they're dead or till you're dead. Right. And that happened a lot because that was another issue where people would take anybody out. Yep. To, to show them property. It would meet anybody at any time, day or night, whether or not there was somebody that might actually be a buyer of real estate. Yeah, I think for me, the reason I use the data up front is I want I want my agents to have the exact opposite experience and my clients. There's no client, no matter how much they like you, that wants to give up all of their time with their family and their friends and their dinners at home and all, all of these things, just looking at houses. That's not what they want. It creates uncertainty when people are going through the home buying process. And maybe there's a little bit of excitement, but overall, most personality types crave stability and their home is where their stability comes from. And so the faster you can get them comfortable with the facts and what the options are and get them moving towards what's realistic, the happier they are. So for me, I never put someone in the car to go look at properties until we had a consultation and we really sat down and mapped out their needs. Does it exist? What are the things we need to be aware of? How much over ask are people bidding? Is it still in our budget when we get to the price that these properties are actually selling for? What are the concessions? Are they offering closing costs or not? And if they're not offering closing costs, how are we gonna structure that with your finances? And that's another thing. I think that real estate agents that say the lender's responsible for the financing, I think that that's a lack of experience. And really, it's that you're not yet comfortable with all of the financial programs. And I'm not saying you need to be a lender, but my goodness, people make decisions about buying and selling based on numbers every day. And you have to be able to take the numbers, which is where they get stuck, and move to their heart. And you cannot do that if you don't know the facts about the numbers. You also can't make the right decisions for your clients and make sure you're truly giving them the right advice if you're telling them, you know, as an example, you should bid on this property and you need to waive the appraisal contingency in order to buy the property. Well, what's their cash position? How is that going to work if the property doesn't appraise? Have you coached them through understanding that all the way? Or are you crossing your fingers and hoping it appraises because you didn't really explain that all the way? Yeah. I think that's the difference. The agents that are super educated and can give their clients all the details, those are, those are the agents that have the ability to scale because those kind of risky decisions where you're not communicating openly and you're not facing the facts, that's what causes the clients to mistrust our industry as a whole. Yeah, no, you're great point it drives me crazy when i see somebody ask a question and then i see somebody answer saying well that's not in my lane stay in your own lane right no we'll learn about there are certain things that you can learn about that are going to make and i go back for me i used to say there are four things you, to sell real estate four things that are critical and we're in agreement here the first one is product knowledge which is exactly what you're talking about the data the product knowledge so you have to have product knowledge you need, and that again, the, that's, the data is a very important aspect of the product knowledge. You need to have sales skills. Those are communication skills. So it's product knowledge, sales skills. Then you need access to clients. And then you need to practice with integrity, right? So it's product knowledge, sales skills, access to clients and integrity. And if you can bring those four things into your practice, you're going to be successful in real estate sales. Yep. I think that's very true. I think that communication is actually critically important and it's undervalued. Um, I love the book that everybody's talking about right now, What to Say. What to Say in Real Estate, I think is the name of it. It's black with the white letters. Do you know what I'm talking about, Saul? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. So I love that because I think most of the time in real estate, people like brokers, team leaders, they say, hey, go make phone calls so you can convert leads. And it's like, well, 
what do I do? How do I do that? Tell me how, and then I'll do the work. And so when I got in this business, one of the most challenging things for me, I was at a Remax and my broker was just not available. He actually had Lyme disease. And so he was in the hospital and was not at the brokerage for a lot of the beginning of my career. Really, really nice man. I liked him a lot, but he was absent. And so I felt like, well, what, what do I need to say? And what do I need to do? And everyone said, well, go generate leads and then, you know, take those leads to see houses. I'm like, okay, uh, that, that sounds good, but how? And yeah. so a lot of what I teach my agents is what to say how to address the objections, how to address their doubts. And that's all, all coming back to being able to demonstrate your expertise is being able to smoothly respond to any concern. Yes, absolutely. You know, and then another great point is when you first go to work in real estate, if having a broker present is important, then you need to make sure up front that that broker is going to be available. When I first got my real estate sales license, it was 1975. And I went to work for a broker. I didn't know what questions to ask. Yeah. And so I went to work for a broker who was a nice guy, but he was never around because he specialized in 1031 tax deferred exchanges. Yeah. And his custody and he sold and he had a customer base and his customer base was not the kind of customer base that I was looking for, which is somebody who wanted to buy a house. Right. Right. And so it took me a while to figure out that I was at the wrong brokerage. Yeah. For me, I think um, I didn't even know that it was supposed to be different. Right. I had no idea that other people at other brokerages, their broker was there. So all I knew is I'm pretty assertive. Like I am not a um, quiet wallflower by any stretch of the imagination, which I think everyone knows about me here. I was vocal when I needed help. And so one of the times I actually said to him, I will make you a lot of money. I'm going to be good at this. So I had confidence in myself. I just didn't know what to do. I said, I'm going to make you a lot of money. Here's what I need from you. When he had come in the office, I said, I need you to sit down with me and explain the contract like you would explain it to a client. I want to hear the words you use to explain the legal jargon that I'm seeing on this contract. And he said, oh, I don't have time. And I said, hey, sit down. And he was like, wait, is she talking to me? I'm like, I'm talking to you. I need your help. You sit down. So he sits down. And I said, now walk me through what you would say. And he said, you know what? I haven't read this contract in 14 years. I have no idea what it says. And um, I can't tell you what I would say. So can you ask my assistant? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? How's that possible? This is the person who's supposed to giving me guidance. So I'd say to anybody watching this, you deserve to have support. What we're doing is dealing with a huge financial asset for our clients. And if we don't have the right support, no matter how much we care, no matter how much we want to do the right thing for our client and have integrity, as Saul said, it's really hard to make sure that we're making the right decisions because it's a lot. You're learning a lot of details and one check mark missed in a contract can can cause your clients to lose their earnest money deposit, can cause them to miss out on getting the perfect home. The stakes are high. The good news is we're not dealing with life and death in real estate, but we're dealing, like I think about doctors and I'm like, wow, the pressure they must be under because we're under a lot of pressure because of the money involved and the people's homes that are involved. It's emotional too. Yeah, so no. Saul, do you have one other tactical thing? I know we both need to wrap up at 4.30. One other tactical thing you want to share for agents that are watching to help them do more business this year? You know, it's... I think that when we probably talked about this before as well, I think there's too much emphasis on lead generation and that people really need to go back to the drawing board and look at what are ways that I can meet more people? How can I be in front of more people? That's going to open up 
other people and that's going to make my life easier if i'm selling real estate so if i look at everything today i, I think one of the things that uh, i'm not crazy about is the emphasis on lead generation and working with strangers and i know you can build relationships and i know but i would rather see people out there talking to people meet, meeting people and i think that'll help anybody that's attempting to sell real estate today i love that you brought that up so i'll share a really specific example from the other day i was talking to an agent who was thinking about joining a team now remember i have a huge team and i believe in teams but i know a lot about this agent's business and so my feeling is always i want to operate in service of the individual so i asked her well wait a minute you capped like last year in your brokerage you're really successful what is it that you're looking for from a team and she said well you know i just want the leads and i want to save time huh. right and she i said what would you want to do with the extra time and she's like i would want to go volunteer with dogs i said why don't you go volunteer with dogs as a way of getting business so that's actually something we've done as a team we do pet adoptions and we do them right outside our office like that might sound crazy if you have a, a a listing where the seller has a passion for dogs too. do a pet adoption in the neighborhood and meet all the neighbors and collect their information and stay in touch with them you guys would be amazed as Saul said if you just start thinking about the business differently and thinking about what do you love doing and how can you bring people together to meet them when you're doing something you love Early in my career, I did something called Women and and Women and Wine on Wednesdays, and basically, I joined B and I. And the first time I went there, I did not like the feeling I had. I don't like to be sold. And the guy was essentially, I was a guest, and he was essentially saying to me, "Why didn't you bring anyone today? It's your responsibility to bring people to expand this group." And I'm like looking around. I'm like, "He can't be serious. Is he talking to me? I just got here. He should still be selling me on being here, right?" So I ended up making my own. I like drinking wine. I like women. And for the next two years, every other Wednesday, we would go drink wine together. And a lot of business came from that. So figure out your way of meeting people that you actually enjoy and do that as a means of growing your business. So great, yeah. great advice, Saul. Thank you guys so much. I am jumping on a plane. So I'm going to jump off here. Everyone have a fantastic week. Great to see you again, Carrie. Take care, everyone. Bye. See you soon. Bye. -bye.